Let me say a word of prayer as we begin our service. Lord God, you are almighty. So help us to humble ourselves before you this night. Take from us the things we think we deserve. The things we think you owe us. And help us to come tonight, first of all, to worship you and to praise you. For you are God Almighty, maker of the heavens and the earth. You are God Almighty, the creator of these light evenings and the birds that sing and the fields of flowers that sway in the wind. Who are we that you care for us? But we believe that you will be with us tonight as we join our voices together in praise of our almighty God. So we ask God for your blessing upon our evening together. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, what a privilege it is and what a gift that we are free to choose to come and praise you. We're not like the disciples once 
in locked rooms hidden for fear. We're not like churches in so many parts of the world where they're scared to meet and threats are made upon them. We're not like churches around the world where Bibles are scarce or smuggled in. We can come and freely praise you and offer our worship to hear your word, to sing your songs. Forgive us, God, when we take it for granted. One day every knee shall bow. And forgive us, God, when now we take you for granted. Forgive us when we forget what your Son did for us. When we forget the cost, the pain upon him and those who loved him. Forgive us God when faith is weak. When temptation is strong to walk different paths. By your grace and mercy forgive us. And bring us back onto the paths of righteousness. Lord God, we are free to come before you and give thanks. Thanks in all circumstances. Thank you for our health. Thank you for the food that nourishes us. Thank you for family. And friends who like us. Thank you for the diversions you give us. For crosswords and quizzes. Thank you for this Sabbath day. That we offer to you tonight. And together with our brothers and sisters, here in Galashiels, here in the borders, together with our brothers and sisters in locked rooms, and in places without Bibles, together with the imprisoned, together with the scared, together with the uncertain, we pray that most perfect of prayers that was taught to us by Jesus Christ, our Father. We have two readings this evening, both from the New Testament. The first is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, the first ten verses. Matthew 27, reading from verse 1. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and elders of the people made their plans how to have Jesus executed. So they bound him led him away and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned 
the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. The chief priests picked up the coins and said, It is against the law to put this into the treasury, since it is blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. He took the thirty pieces of silver, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field, as the Lord commanded me. And our second reading is from the book of Acts, and it's Acts chapter 1, first one, verses 12 to 26. Acts chapter 1, 12 to 26, that's the end of the chapter. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about a hundred and twenty, and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as guide For those who arrested Jesus, he was one of our number and shared in our ministry. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong. His body burst open and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called the field in their language Akeldama, which is field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, May his place be deserted, that there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. Therefore it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us, for one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over the apostolic ministry which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the eleven apostles. Amen. Dear God, we believe that you are with us tonight in heaven. We believe that your Son, Jesus Christ, is at your right hand, interceding for us, watching over us. And we believe that the Holy Spirit is with us in this room. So in your grace, in your mercy, God Almighty, three in one. Help us to hear your word tonight. Help it to thrill us. Help us to warm our hearts. And help us to grow closer to you through hearing your word. Amen. So we are going to look at Acts 
chapter 1, verses 12 to 26. Now, there are a number of Bibles here. If anyone wants one, do just stick up your hand and I'll be glad to pass one over. So if you imagine the Bible, if you think of the Bible almost in three parts or three movements, if we think of all, first of all, of the Old Testament, which is very much full of the promises that point towards the coming of Jesus Christ. So if we imagine that the first part of the Bible, that the Old Testament pointing us towards Jesus Christ. Then there's the New Testament, which speaks of the coming of Jesus and all that he did. Forgive me, the Gospels that speak of the coming of Jesus and all that he did and his departure. And then there's the third part, which begins in Acts, which now is the sharing of the good news of Jesus Christ, the preaching of the good news, the establishment of the church to gather believers together and the equipping of them to continue fulfilling the Great Commission, to go out and make disciples of all nations. It is in that third part of the great movement that we are in now today in Gallish Hills. And it's in that third part that we'll remain until Jesus comes again. And the reading that Tom read for us, I do say rather beautifully, is very much almost a transition from that second part, from the departure of Jesus, and almost now preparing, as we'll hear next week, the story of Pentecost, to the coming of the Holy Spirit. And what I'm going to do tonight, because it's Ascension Sunday, I'm just going to read through the first part of that chapter, Acts chapter 1, just to read it through, to remind us of the ascension of Jesus back to heaven. And then we'll look through the verses that Tom read for us from Acts. And what I want to do as we look through that, I want to suggest some changes in the disciples, some characteristics in the disciples that we may not have seen in the same way before. But something now is changing. Something now is showing that they're equipped to be ready for the great job that Jesus Christ has given them. So I want to suggest some characteristics that they are now showing that seem to be the same characteristics that we need as we continue to make disciples of all nations. So let me just read to you the first part of Acts chapter 1, which is the story of the ascension. After his suffering, Luke says in Acts chapter 1 verse 3, Jesus presented himself to the disciples. He gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. After his suffering, after he rose again, he appeared to the disciples over a period of 40 days and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait Wait for the gift my father has promised, the gift which you have heard me speak about. For John, John the Baptist, he baptised with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. The disciples gathered round him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? It's not for you to know the times or dates the father has sent by his own authority. But you will receive, says Jesus, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes in you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him <coughs> from their sight. The disciples were looking intently up into the sky as Jesus was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said. Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then the apostles, in verse 12, then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. 
Actually, Luke in his gospel gives us a bit more information. After describing the ascension, he says that the disciples then worshipped Jesus and didn't just return to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, but returned with great joy. After all the time they've been worrying about Jesus going, when Jesus now goes, they're filled with great joy. This isn't, a, this isn't a despondent story. This is a joyful story. The story of Jesus on earth does not end with a crucified Jesus. Does not even end with a resurrected Jesus. But ends in great joy with an ascended Jesus. And this ascension happened on the Mount of Olives. And the disciples now return to Jerusalem, which is about a Sabbath's walk from the Mount of Olives. Now, a Sabbath's walk, by the way, is a recognised measurement. It doesn't mean that this happened on the Sabbath. It means something like half a mile. And it comes, and there's a nice bit of history, it comes from the, the days when the Israelites were in the wilderness. And as they travelled along, they, they carried almost the tent of God, as they called it, or the tabernacle of God, the presence of God. And each time they set it down, and on the Sabbath, they, they lined up all the tribes around and the furthest away tribe was about a half a mile away from the tabernacle. And so when they called them all in, that was, the, that was the maximum distance you could walk on a Sabbath. And it was about half a mile. And that's where you get this measurement, a Sabbath day's walk. And we know why they've returned to Jerusalem, the disciples. Because as it said earlier on in Acts, Jesus told them to. Wait in Jerusalem, he said, for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Do you remember in John 21 when Jesus said to them, go and wait for me in the mount in Galilee? And instead they went off fishing. Peter led them off fishing. See what's happening now. Notice the change. Now they're obedient to the commands of Jesus. What difference has taken place in these 40 days? Now when Jesus says, go and wait for me, they do it. So they arrive in Jerusalem and they go upstairs to the room where they were staying which quite possibly is the same upper room that the Last Supper took place in, the same room in which they'd been locked in fear. And then it gives us a list of the 11 disciples. Of course, not 12 disciples now, but 11 disciples. And when I was in the church a while ago, I remember the minister asked us just to shout out and list all the 11 disciples. And well, there was quite a lot of silence. Um, and everyone struggled to, including myself, struggled to list all the disciples. And in some ways I think that's okay, because um, they're not often named, a lot of them. And I think in the great story of Jesus, it's okay if we point towards Jesus and remember Jesus and what he did, rather than necessarily remembering all the names of the disciples. But I, I decided this week I would try and learn, make sure I knew all the names as well. So I thought it'd be helpful for us just to go through these names, just to remind us of who the disciples were. And we start with Peter. And of course, we know Peter, the rock, who Jesus then said to go and feed my sheep. We then go into John. John, the one who wrote the, the, John, the one who wrote the, who wrote the, who wrote the gospel, the one who Jesus said was the disciple whom he loved. Then we go on to James, and I, I see this actually there, so you guys can see it. Um, so, so do stop me if I get this wrong. So then we go on to James, and James, um, James, we know is the disciple, a fisherman, and indeed, as we see later on in Acts, it says that James was martyred. James was killed by King Herod with the sword. It says. Then we go on to John. Uh, forgive me. Then, then we go on to Andrew. Our patron saint, patron saint of Scotland, another fisherman, the brother of Peter. And in John's gospel, certainly the very first disciple called. We then go on to Philip, not mentioned often in the Bible, perhaps best known for bringing Nathaniel to Jesus. Nathaniel, come, I think he's the one. What do you mean? Can anything good come from Nazareth? And then we come on to Thomas. And we know about Thomas, of course, and all his doubts. And Bartholomew, who probably is another name for Nathaniel. Matthew, we know, writer of the gospel, the tax collector, who Jesus said, come and follow me. And we have James, less well known now, James, son of Alphaeus, that Jesus put his trust in. We'd need to guess about him. There's lots of Jameses about. There's Simon the Zealot. 
We don't know what he was zealous for, whether he was zealous for revolution, zealous for overthrowing the Romans, zealous for the coming of the Messiah. We don't know where he got his name as Simon the Zealot. Zealot. And finally, Judith, son of James, not to be mixed up with the other Judas, also known as Thaddeus. So that's the 11 disciples as they're listed at this stage, these people that Jesus put his trust in. But it's not just them, they're joined together with the women and with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. In fact, Luke 24 again tells us something even better, that not just that they're joined together constantly in prayer, but they were continually at the temple praising God. What's happened? They were locked in a room for fear of the Jews. And now they're going out and they're going to the temple and continually praising God. I would suggest that they've not just become obedient to God, they've become courageous. They've got a courage now that they didn't have before. And the women were there, it says. These women, of course, who were the first to witness the resurrection of Jesus. And rather movingly, certainly I think, we're told that Mary, the mother of Jesus, is there. And this is the last mention of Mary in the Bible. And so she's not now in this last mention, watching her son on the cross. She's not the lady who doesn't quite understand her son. She's in this moment of joy, worshipping and praising the work her son has completed. This is a wonderful and joyful final mention of Mary, mother of Jesus in the Bible. And perhaps best of all for Mary is that it says that Jesus' brothers are there also. Jesus had four brothers we know of, James and Joseph, Simon and Jude. And way back in John chapter 7 verse 5, we're said that his, we were told that his brothers are not believers. Even his own brothers did not believe him. But look at this now. We're told that Jesus appeared to his brother James. Perhaps it was James that told the other brothers. We know the the great things that James and also Jude are going to do for the early church. We know that James was probably martyred as well. But here we see this wonderful moment that the disciples are not just obedient, they're not just courageous, but they're now believing. There's more coming in belief. And for Mary in this wonderful last mention, we have this moment with not just joyfully praising her son Jesus Christ, but now also that his brothers have come in faith as well. And so it's in those days, these wonderful days these joyful days that Peter stands up in front of them a group of about 120 which in terms of Christianity spreading is not a huge amount and Peter says brothers and sisters the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus Judas was one of our number and shared in our ministry. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field in their language Akeldama, that is, field of blood. Peter says it's written in the book of Psalms, May his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, And also may another take his place of leadership. Do you notice something new about Peter? Do you notice how often in the New Testament, in the Gospels, that the Old Testament was referred to? But it was always by Jesus. And here's now Peter. My goodness. Here's now Peter joining the dots. Seeing the links between the promises of the Old Testament and what happened in, and was fulfilled through Jesus. Here they are growing in understanding. I just want to say a brief word about Judas and his tragedy. And I suppose the warning that's there for us. In Matthew 27 that Tom read for us. 
We read that awfully sad moment when Judas was seized with remorse and tried to return the 30 pieces of silver because he had sinned, he said. But listen to what he said. He says, I have betrayed innocent blood. There's no evidence of belief in Jesus as his saviour. No evidence that he felt that he'd betrayed Jesus, the son of God. But just that he'd betrayed innocent blood. And what Peter is explaining now is that the tragedy, tragedy of Judas was no surprise to God. It was anticipated already in the Old Testament and Jesus anticipated it. It is a tragedy that Judas chose not to put his trust in Jesus Christ. But Peter's helping the others understand that it was part of God's plan. That God is in control, evenly, even in seemingly awful moments. I think it's worth remembering that in all the moments we have with Jesus with the disciples, the many journeys, those Sabbath walks picking heads of corn, all the experiences, all that time, Jesus knew what Judas would do. Yet it seems that he treated him with the same love and same kindness as the others. So it's necessary, Peter's now saying, to choose one of the men who's been with us the whole time. The whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us. From the baptism of John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And so they nominate Barsabbath or Joseph and Matthias. And they pray. Lord, you know everyone's heart. It's not clear here, by the way, who they're praying to. Are they praying to God? Or are they now praying to Jesus Christ? I like to think it's the latter. That they are now praying to Jesus. Jesus, you knew them. You were with these people. Show us which of these two you've chosen to take over this apostolic ministry which Judas left to go where he belongs. Certainly we read of times now when when the followers of Jesus in the early church prayed to him. Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And they're fulfilling what it says in John 5, that all people should honour the Son even as they honour the Father. So the disciples cast lots. The lot falls to Matthias and he is added to our list of the eleven. And so the stage now is set for Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. The disciples are ready. They are obeying. They're trusting. They're courageous. They're praising. They're growing in knowledge and growing in belief. And these are the same characteristics that we should have. To be obedient to the teachings of Jesus Christ. To be courageous in serving him. To continually seek to grow in knowledge. And to trust that through Jesus Christ we can bring in new believers. And this is what we are called to do until Jesus returns. And until Jesus returns, where is he? He is ascended. Jesus is king. Jesus is answering prayers. And he is preparing a room for each one of us. So until he comes again, we know what we must do. Do. Amen. The conclusion when all has been heard is fear God and keep his commandment. The conclusion when all has been heard, fear the Lord. The
conclusion when all has been heard is fear God and keep his commandment. And surely this applies to every, every person. And surely this applies to every, every person. Try it again with me. Let's learn it. Will the conclusion when all has been heard is fear God and keep His commandment? The conclusion when all has been heard. supplies to every every person and surely this supplies to every every person remember your creator in the days of your youth think back on your creator before the mass The daughters of the song of the Lord are singing us so softly. Supplies to every every person. The conclusion and the conclusion when all has been heard is fear God and keep His commandments. The conclusion when all has been heard. I hear the second verse. Think back on the Lord of Life before the silver cord is broken. Remember the Lord of Life before the golden bowl is crushed and the spear. Supplies to every every person. Surely this supplies to every, every one more time. The conclusion, the conclusion that all has been heard is for God and keep His commandment. The conclusion when all has been heard. Here we go. 
God and keep his commandment. And surely this applies to every, every person. And surely this applies to every, every person. Lord God, can we thank you in your graciousness for those who have come before us? Thank you, God, for those disciples, for all that they got right. Thank you for the trust your son Jesus put in them. And the courageous and obedient way that they carried out his work. We know that so many of them had dreadful ends. But they trusted in you. They trusted in the message of Jesus Christ. And through their courage and their bravery... That message travelled just as Jesus planned it to be. We thank you for those we know in our past who have guided us towards our faith. Particularly we thank you for those who are no longer with us. Who are we that you look out for us? That you put the right people in our path. That you don't give up on us. Thank you God for those around us now. Who help us in our faith. Thank you for husbands and wives. For friends, children and grandchildren. You're so good to us, God. There are so many we know and do not know that we so wish can come to faith as well. There are those so close to us in our households. Those around us. Dear God, in your mercy, put the right people in their path. If it's us, give us the courage. Give us the obedience. Give us the desire to grow in faith. Help us to always live, knowing that your Son, Jesus Christ, is preparing a room for us now. So help us to use our time here productively to share your message. We give you thanks, Lord, for the good news that comes from Cox's Bazaar. Thank you that the cyclone didn't hit. We continue to pray for them. That those Rohingya Christians may grow in faith, may grow in number. We give you thanks for our girls' brigade and all their leaders. We pray for their meeting tomorrow, but especially we pray for the race for life, that this event goes well, that it's fun and it's happy and it's safe. Bless them, Lord. Bless them in their travel. Bless them when it's hard work, when logistics need sorted out, and bless them in their laughter and a sense of a job well done.
We pray for Margaret and Lynn and all the family. Thank you for Margaret Groggins. Thank you for her faith, the way she shares it. Thank you for the joy she finds in life. And be with her God tonight. We pray so much that you're with Graham Patterson. Bless him in his healing. But also in getting through this time. We pray you may come and join us. Your precious child that you love so much. We continue to pray for Joy, who asks for our prayers and places such importance in our prayers. Thank you for giving her children who love her so much and help her so much. Thank you for our faith that is keeping her going. And we pray for her week ahead. Lord God, thank you so much for hearing our prayers. Thank you for delighting in our prayers. And you know the things that we will face this week. You know the moments that lie ahead. We place them before you now. And ask that you bless our week ahead. Please go before us into rooms, into meetings we, we are worried about. Help us with diaries that feel too full. Encourage us, Lord, in moments when we don't feel encouraged by others. Until we gather again the next Sabbath. We ask so much that you be with us and be with those for whom we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Of the moment of Jesus ascending to heaven, Luke wrote these words of that very moment. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, which is by the Mount of Olives, Jesus lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. And so now let us go out with love and joy and confidence and peace. And may the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us this evening and forevermore. Amen.